Laz got sick. It's not the way it's supposed to go, but Jesus loves Laz. So now Jesus is gonna turn this the way it's supposed to go. Jesus is gonna go and show up and cure Laz. Because when you're in Christ, God, the Holy Spirit comes to live in you and make your dead heart alive. We're continuing this series called uh, Jesus in His Own Words, where we're looking at the great I Am statements from the book of John. And even though we kind of have a light attendance tonight, we got a special visitor that I want to come and ask to pray for us for, as we hear the word. My friend, Pastor David Rosa, pastors Cruciform Church that's in Hollywood, Hallandale. Right now their location is in Hallandale. And our church was planted just six months after Cruciform was launched. And we did a lot of things together in the early years. And what's been funny is we've kind of been like cross town cousins with them for the last 10 years. And they kind of went west, we went east. And then when our building sold, we went west to 95 and they went east to 95. But they're doing an amazing gospel work here in Hollywood, Hallandale area of Southeast Broward. And I want to ask him to come up just to say hi to you guys and then pray for us as we hear God's word. David, come on up. Let's give him a hand. God bless you, New City. Man, it is so cool to be here with y'all today. Uh, I really mean that. Um, I'm long-winded, so I got to go quick. But love Pastor John. Love the family. It's, man, you're so gifted. It's good to see you. Um, yeah, just, just so encouraged to be here with you all today. Um, uh, we pray for you. Um, man, not as much as I should. But as often as I remember you, I promise, we got a deacon living just down the street. And every time we pass by, uh, I say, man, new city. I love them, love what God is doing in and through them. And so I'm just going to pray for you, pray for the word. Um, and I just want to read and pray over you uh, a prayer from Paul. Pastor John came by and preached for us last week. He preached the beginning portion of uh, Ephesians 3. But in Ephesians 3... 14 and down, uh, the apostle prays this prayer over the church in Ephesus, and I want to pray it over you today. He says, for this reason, I bow my knee before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he might grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith that you being rooted and grounded in love may have the strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love that of Christ that surpasses knowledge that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. Father in heaven, we come before you now because where else can we go? Only you, O oh God, have words of life. And so we done heard a lot of voices this week, uh, voices from the left and from the right, all type of voices. But God, only you are completely true. Your word is righteous. It's light to our path. It's a healing balm for our sin sick souls. And it's the truth we can stand on. So, God, we pray today for the hearing and the reading of your word. Come now and move in power. Speak through your servant, O oh God, that your people might hear that faith would be a strengthened God, that conviction might set in, and that Jesus would be seen. Come now, O oh God. Come by your spirit. Speak your word that your people may hear. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Love you too, man. All right. New City, what do you do when life doesn't go the way it's supposed to go? What do you do when life doesn't go the way it's supposed to go? Now, if you live in South Florida, life doesn't go the way it's supposed to go as soon as you get on 95, right? <laughs> Like you got a plan and your Google Maps says the time is one thing and then you get on 95 and it's calculating and it adds, right? And that line on, that line on your path gets red. Um, if you get on 95, life doesn't go the way it's supposed to go. If you're a parent, life doesn't go the way it's supposed to go, particularly if you have little kids. I remember about five or six years ago, my wife and I took our three girls to a park in East Hollywood 
And it was this sunny day. My wife and I are having a great conversation. We were going to go ahead and go home and barbecue. The kids were having a blast. And then all of a sudden, as we're sitting there talking, we hear this dong. And what had happened is our oldest had run at full speed into a pole on the playground and caused it to go dong, just like one of those big bells did. So we ran over to her. She's laying like coal conked out. And uh, we had to take her to the hospital that afternoon. She was fine, nothing permanent that we know of. But for the next couple of weeks, she had a huge welt on her head. And while we were planning on having a really fun time, you know, it, life didn't go the way it's supposed to go. In fact, we kind of de developed a philosophy about, um, about parenting that I, I want to patent as the George Costanza method of parenting. Um, George Costanza, if you're not, if you're new to this country or you weren't alive in the 1900s, George Costanza is a character on the show Seinfeld, and he's kind of this pathetic character. And there's this one episode where he decides to always leave on a high note. So what happens is he goes into these rooms or board meetings or talks with his friends, and he makes a really funny joke, and everyone's like, ah, oh, that's amazing. But then he tries to push it a little bit further and, and tell a follow-up joke, and it's not funny at all. And so he changes his philosophy, and he says, look, as soon as I get everyone to laugh, I'm leaving. I'm literally just going to get up and walk out. I'm out. I'm on a high note. And so he does it. It's hysterical. Like he makes everybody laugh. And then the meeting's not over. He's like, I'm done. And he just gets up and walks out. We started doing that with parenting because things don't go the way they're supposed to go. So everyone's having fun. No one's crying. No one's complaining. No one's hungry. It's time to go home. <laughs> We're out. We're going to leave on a high note because parenting doesn't go the way it's supposed to go. It's kind of funny when we talk about the lighter things of life, but you know, uh, when it comes to the heavier things of life, it's much more painful when life doesn't go the way things are supposed to go. Uh, when finances don't work out, you planned, you plan for them to work out a certain way and then you get that bill or the work budget comes in and life doesn't go the way it was supposed to go. Or, or something much more troubling like, like death or like illness, or like sickness happens, and, and you go, that's not the way it was supposed to go. When relationships break down or ministry opportunities don't work out, life doesn't go the way it's supposed to go. And oftentimes, as I look back on things that have happened in my life where life hasn't gone the way it's supposed to go, I can get either fearful or I can get resentful. Fearful about the future and something in the future not going the way it's supposed to go resentful about the past, about frustration that something didn't go the way it's supposed to go. But as I think about being a Christian, I don't want to live my life fearful about the future or resentful about the past. I don't want to. As a follower of Jesus, I, I want to be full of hope. I want to be full of hope. Now, hope is not something that we have a wish for. Like one pastor called hope, wishing for adults. For instance, this week is the Olympics, and I saw this really funny meme that said, um, you can call yourself an Olympic hopeful. No one checks. There's no form to fill out. You can just say, John Homus, Olympic hopeful, because I am. I'm an Olympic hopeful. But hope isn't like that. In the Bible, hope isn't just wishing for adults. Hope is something certain. It's factual, based on who Jesus is, and what he's done for us. This week, we're looking at this passage, John eleven twenty-five 25 through 26. And Jesus says this, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet he shall live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Because if you believe this, when life doesn't go how it's supposed to go, you can actually face life, and for that matter, death, with hope. Because Jesus is the resurrection and the life. In our story, leading up to that point where Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life, what has happened is his dear friend Lazarus has gotten sick. Lazarus is one of three siblings. You might recognize the names Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. 
Lazarus seems to be the younger brother of a family of siblings that Jesus really loved. He loved them. Mary anointed his feet. Uh, Jesus seemed to go over to the sibling's house and just hang out, out, hang out. Like when he wanted to get away from ministry, it seems like they were so close to him that that's where he'd go. And so Lazarus gets sick and it seems like it's a very serious sickness. And in verse three, it says, so the sisters sent to him, Jesus saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. They don't even ask Jesus to come. They just say, hey, the one you love, the one who's like a brother to you, Laz, is sick. And I love their humble presumption. We don't even need to tell Jesus to come. We just tell him Laz is sick. Verse five, now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. And in verse five, the the verb for love is like amped up. So in verse three, the word for love is phileo, Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. In verse five, John reassures us that he, that Jesus really does love this family because the word love is agape, which says Jesus didn't just love Lazarus as a brother, rather he loved Lazarus and he loved Mary and he loved Martha with a supernatural kind of love that doesn't come from us humans. It only comes from the God of heaven. And it is a self-giving, self-sacrificial love. And so we find this out, hey, listen, Laz got sick. It's not the way it's supposed to go, but Jesus loves Laz. So now Jesus is gonna turn this the way it's supposed to go. Jesus is gonna go and show up and cure Laz. Except he doesn't. In verse six, John tells us, so when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Well, that's not how it's supposed to go. It's not how it's supposed to go because Lazarus ends up dying because Jesus doesn't go. Now, we know he's not indifferent. We've been told twice that he loves and really loves Mary, Martha, and Laz. And so we go, what's going on? But it helps us because a lot of times when you and I have a problem in our life and we have faith that Jesus can fix it and we know he loves us, We say, Jesus, turn this thing the way it's supposed to go, right? I believe you can. I know you love me. I know you see this. And this is challenging because sometimes he doesn't. Now we know Jesus's love never has an off button. There is no on or off button because it's always on. Jesus's love for us is always 100% committed 100% of the time. But sometimes his love for us doesn't translate to the prevention of pain in our lives. Sometimes painful things enter our lives and it's not because Jesus doesn't love us. He still loves us in the midst of those things. And the reason is because there's something deeper than the prevention of pain. And that's the purpose that Jesus has to show us who he is. See, we skipped over one verse. In verse four, Jesus tells us, this sickness will not end in death but it's for the glory of God so that the son of God may be glorified through it. See, sometimes things don't go the way they're supposed to go and Jesus's purpose in it not going is that you'll have a clearer view of who he is. You'll see the significance of him as the great I am. You'll understand the weight of him in your life even when your life doesn't go the way it's supposed to go. See, if you're not yet a Christian, if you're exploring the Christian faith, one of the things you'll hear Christians say after they go through a trial, the first thing they'll say is, I never want to go through that again. No, thank you. I'm done. You know, God signed me up for the blessed and highly favored package next year, you know. But but the second thing that they'll say, the second thing that they'll say is, but in that trial, in that hard thing, in it going not the way it was supposed to go, Jesus had a purpose and I saw more clearly who he was and I love him more and he's more significant to me and I'm just more thankful for who he is. Both of those things are always in tension. Justin Buzzard says, God has bigger purposes for human suffering than humans are able to see. And that's challenging, but it's true. 
In verse 14 and 15, Jesus tells his disciples plainly, Lazarus has died. I'm glad for you that I wasn't there so that you may, what? Believe. But let's go to him. Now, I realize just in these words, it it can sound like a little cold and aloof from Jesus. Like, it's okay if you go through pain as long as you ascend your mind to understand who I am. It, It sounds a little cold and aloof that we would go through this pain and Jesus would kind of be distant from Laz like that. But let's, let's see if that's really true. Jesus approaches the area, the place where Lazarus has died, and Martha runs out to him, Mary waits in the house. But when they both encounter him, they have the exact same statement for him. They say the exact same thing. Martha in verse 21 and Mary in verse 32 say, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Lord, if you had been here, this wouldn't have gone this way. It would have gone the way it's supposed to go. But what I love about Jesus' response is what he doesn't do. He doesn't scold them and say, how dare you? I'm the Lord and Savior of the universe. How dare you question me? He doesn't say that. He, He also doesn't say, hey, listen, don't be sad. You know, don't be sad. Uh, You know, hold your emotions in. No, Jesus is absolutely present with them. With with Martha, he engages her through teaching her. With, With Mary, he's just present with her in the pain. Martha goes on in verse 22 to say, but even now, I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Now, Martha knows her scripture. She believes Jesus, but she misses the significance of who he is. Jesus is just another player in scripture to her, not the point of scripture. Jesus is in God's plan to her, but she doesn't realize God's plan is about him. Jesus is someone sent by God, but not the one sent by God. Jesus lived a good life, but she didn't realize he would live a perfect life, die, and come back defeating death. And so Jesus presses in. In verse 25 and 26, we get our theme verse. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Let's back up just for a moment. In the midst of this, Lazarus is dead. Here's the thing about death, though. Death is uncomfortable to talk about. But death is always the way life goes. New City, I hate to tell you, but everyone here in this room will face death. One day you will. And you might say, well, that's dark, but it's true. Every one of us has an expiration date. And the reason that that is our new normal, that the reason that life always goes towards death is because our first parents, Adam and Eve, rebelled in the Garden of Eden. And when they rebelled, they brought sin into the world. They brought death between them and God. They brought death between them and each other. And they brought death into themselves because one day their body would be separated from their soul. Death is now the way life goes. Jim Morrison, the front man for The Doors, a band from 50 years ago, sang this depressing song, and in the middle of it, one of the lyrics was, no one here gets out alive. No one here gets out alive. But in the midst of the darkness, in the midst of the darkness of death, Jesus looks confidently, calmly, but decisively and says, I am the resurrection and I am the life. He who believes in me will die, but will live. Do you believe this? See, as Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life, death hears Jesus and screams, that's not the way it's supposed to go. 
Death thinks it's supposed to be final. Death thinks it's supposed to be permanent. But when Jesus enters the picture, death is no longer the way things go. Because Jesus is the resurrection and the life. Death no longer has the final word. Jesus makes things go wrong for death. He looks death in the eye and defeats it by dying on the cross for our sins, by being buried in the tomb, and on the third day rising again. Jesus defeats death. As Martha begins to understand that Jesus isn't just part of the plan, he is the plan. The, the, weight, the, sh- the weight of her trust shifts from partially on Jesus to fully on Jesus. And in verse 27, she says, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the son of God who is coming into the world. Jesus is the Messiah. He is the chosen one. He is the one who lived the life we should have lived. And he died the death we deserve to die on the cross so that when we repent and believe, we might live. Eternally, we will face death, but in Christ, we will be raised from the dead. Life eternal, but that life eternal starts now. Because when you're in Christ, God the Holy Spirit comes to live in you and make your dead heart alive so that you begin to live like Jesus, not by your own power, but by the the presence of the one who says, I am the resurrection and the life. He now lives, but he lives in you. And he's present with you even when things don't go the way they're supposed to go. In verse 33, he finally meets up with Martha, with Mary. She says the same thing to him. If you had been here, this wouldn't have happened. This didn't go the way it's supposed to go. And it didn't go that way because you weren't here. But in verse 33, when Jesus saw Mary weeping and the Jews had come with her, were also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. Deeply moved and greatly troubled. Those words mean sorrow and anger, but stronger than that, like gut punch and snorting with agitation. Jesus is angry, but he's not angry at his friends. He's not angry at Mary and Martha for all the questions they've had or for, or for wondering if, if, why he didn't come Jesus is mad at death itself. He's angry at death and its effects on his friends. Jesus is not aloof. And and, and only the way that Jesus can, he has a purpose beyond what Mary and Martha can see. And yet he's fully present with them in this emotional moment, full of sorrow, full of anger at death. See, when, when things don't go the way they're supposed to go, Jesus wants to show you the significance of who he is, and yet he is in it with you, bearing the weight of your sadness. When things don't go the way they're supposed to go, Jesus is with you with the full strength of his divine power and at the same time, full of your tears in his own. When life doesn't go the way it's supposed to go, he is there as the resurrection and the life, and yet he's there weeping with you. Look how the story ends. In verse 34, and he said, where have you laid him? I want you to hear the sorrow and anger and the emotion in Jesus's voice. And he said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. Verse 38, then Jesus deeply moved again came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor for he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me and I knew that you always hear me 
But I said this on account of the people standing around me that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The man who had died came out, his hands and feet bound with linen strips and his face wrapped with a cloth. And Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. I'm gonna invite the worship team to come back up. Jesus raises Lazarus to life because he is the resurrection and the life. And here's the interesting thing. Lazarus would one day die again, but one day he will be raised again from the dead with you. Because just like Lazarus, if you know Christ, his power is in you now, both for this life and the life to come. So what do you take home? What do you take away from Jesus as the resurrection of the life and the life? Three things. First, because Jesus is resurrection, you can face death with hope. You can face death with hope. Just yesterday, I opened up Facebook and a friend of mine who lives in another city, he's actually another church planner, just posted that he lost his wife suddenly that morning. The post was like one minute old and my gut just dropped. And that's real. At the same time, because of Jesus, there's hope. You and I have an expiration date, but it's not permanent. Jesus has stared death in the eye for us and defeated it. You can look to the future with hope because ultimately you will be raised from the dead and spend eternity with him. And if you don't know Jesus, I'd love to talk with you about how you can have hope in him for this life and the one to come. Secondly, because Jesus is life, life begins when you trust Jesus, not when things go the way you think they're supposed to go. All of us are kind of waiting for that next thing, right? We're waiting for the promotion or we're waiting for the alleviation. The promotion of something else or the alleviation of pain. And one thing we do is we put too much weight on that. Life doesn't begin when things that are bad stop. Life doesn't begin when those good things that you want to happen, happen. Life begins when you know Jesus because he is the life. Can you rest on the resource that is in you now? Because Jesus is the resurrection and the life. Because that's the last thing. Jesus as the resurrection and the life loves you with a love that you cannot fathom and you cannot measure and you cannot make him turn off. And he's also the power of the resurrection and the power of life. Jesus loves you with an infinite love and he has an infinite power working on your behalf. And what that means is when life doesn't go the way it's supposed to go, nothing is wasted. Nothing is wasted. Jesus has a purpose for everything. He loves you. He is resurrection. He is life and he's with you. Let's pray.